Throughout the course of my videos, we have seen countless masks and therefore countless cabinets and bunkers and equipment cabins, but we've only ever seen the exterior of the sort of cabinets and equipment containers. We've never actually seen inside them. Well, in today's video, I'm going to show you what is inside these mysterious boxes of telecommunications equipment. The first masked cabin that we're going to take a look at was an O2 and Vodafone 2G and 3G site and when these pictures were taken it was sort of midway through its 2G, 3G refresh and 4G ad. So if we just enter in the front door pretty much for this picture there is just stacks and stacks of batteries. The batteries are PowerSafe 12V52F it appears. So therefore 12 volt at 52 amp hours each. There's four of them to each horizontal stack so that makes 48 volts which sounds about right. And as you can see there are a number of stacks so the total amount of power stored in these batteries is really quite significant and will be enough to run the site for at least a number of hours. So now if we leave that battery and entrance compartment to the cabin we'll be able to see the actual sort of sophisticated transmitting equipment. So in this picture we can see the Ericsson RBS 6102 BTS equipment. So there are two horizontal stacks of transmitters each with six vertical modules in them. There is also sort of a control and power unit at the very top. Now this sort of sci-fi shiny piece of equipment is what provides, is sort of what creates and receives and deals with broadcasting the radio access technologies, so 2G, 3G and 4G. Now the top stack of BTS equipment in this case, so the first horizontal stack of six modules can, is for the 800 megahertz 4G broadcast, so band 20. Now helpfully, this has band 20 written on it, so you can tell what band it is. Likewise, each module on the lower stack is marked with band 8, so 900 megahertz, and the 2100 megahertz horizontal stack each module in that case was marked for band 1, although I do not have a picture of that as it was behind these 800 MHz and 900 MHz modules. Now the reason there are 6 vertical modules for each horizontal frequency stack is because each one of those modules provides for one feeder. So if you think there are two feeders for each frequency on each saxer on a sort of typical setup, that means you have two feeders per sector and therefore six feeders required per frequency per mass and that's why there's six vertical modules. Now the actual connection to the antenna on each of these modules is through the sort of blue stoppered ports near the bottom. Now you'll notice on each module there are two of these sort of blue ports. However, only the top ones in each vertical module are used and from the markings I can deduce that probably the top connectors are for transmit and receive whereas the bottom ones only seem to be for receive so potentially for diversity purposes which is not deployed on this individual mast. Now we'll see what a fully cabled RBS6102 stack looks like slightly later on in the video. Now while each vertical module is frequency specific, so 800 megahertz or 900 megahertz, it is not RAT or radioactive technology specific. So each of those modules can do say 2G900 or 3G900 or both for example, it's not linked, it's not locked to one specific technology. And in fact they can probably very easily be switched over to do 4G900 megahertz in the future. Also inside this cabinet is a whole variety of other equipment, so there's another sort of vertical array of equipment, and this is the sort of backhaul array. So this is what connects the mast to the rest of the operator's network. Now at the top of this is a rack mount indoor unit from Microwave Link and NEC Pazalink indoor unit. 
Now this doesn't look like it's in use because while it does have power LEDs on, uh, it doesn't appear to have any of the sort of, I guess, output connections to the Mars broadcast equipment connected to it. It does have coax. On the left is the coax feed from the actual sort of microwave outdoor unit and parabolic antenna connected, but it doesn't appear to sort of have any connection to the rest of the transmitting equipment. And further down on this rack is a BT 21st century leads line fibre end user equipment unit, which will be co connecting the mast onto BT's fibre backhaul network. There is also a whole array of other fibre equipment on that rack, which I'm not completely certain what it's for but it's presumably for distributing the high speed network connectivity to all the equipment in the cabin. Now also inside that cabin, just sitting on the floor at the time, were an array of cathrine diplexes. So what these do is combine frequencies together. So in the case of this one it takes 800 megahertz and 900 megahertz and then combines them into a single set of feeders which is used if you do not have antennas with a whole array of low ports on them. Say if you have 800 MHz and 900 MHz separately you need four feeders and therefore four low band ports on the antenna whereas doing it this way you only need two low band ports on the antenna so therefore potentially widening up your antenna availability choices. Now before this really compact RBS6102 equipment came in the mast had Ericsson 2G BTS equipment and this was quite old and in fact I have some pictures of some similar equipment to what was there and these sort of 2G transmit radios were about the size of a household fridge freezer so you can imagine having three of these took up a very significant amount of space especially compared to the little tiny vertical rack modules that we saw on the RBS6102 equipment. So now let's take a look at a fully cabled cabinet. So this is an RBS6102 cabinet and we can see why it's called this because there is very clearly RBS6102 broadcast equipment within this cabinet. Now these modules in this sort of RBS 6102 rack look very similar to on the inside the cabin of the mast that we've just seen because it's exactly the same equipment except that these modules are each for 2100 megahertz as opposed to the 800 or 900 megahertz ones that we saw before. There are six vertical modules in the 2100 megahertz stack which is for the reason that I discussed earlier regarding the feeder and antenna configurations. Now also we can see that the antenna ports at the bottom of each vertical module, only the top ones are connected like I previously stated. The bottom ones still have their protective blue caps on. Now also underneath in this cabinet we can see there are four batteries again, most likely for 12 volt ones to make 48 volts because 48 volts seems to be a telco grade kind of voltage that's used in a whole variety of sort of that grade of equipment. And then on the left of this cabinet seems to be a whole load of fibre equipment, presumably at least some of it for connecting to the operator's core network. So pretty similar actually to the cabin of the site I showed at the beginning of the video just all compacted into this one little cabinet. However, if the site was going to carry other frequencies, there would be, say, another cabinet carrying the 800 and 900 megahertz equipment as well, which is why the sort of bare minimum configuration for these, for the monopoles, tends to be two large cabinets and then a few smaller ones to do with power management because you have a big cabinet for the 2100 megahertz stuff and then you have a big cabinet for the 800 and 900 megahertz stuff although this does vary a lot depending on the exact configuration they use from site to site so there can actually be rather a lot more cabinets than that due to a whole variety of different configurations. So now I guess to look at a site which isn't a Vodafone and O2 one so this cabinet is a Komodo which are used for 3's 800MHz and 1800MHz LTE and from this we can clearly see how that works. 
So the top modules, the top vertical modules, have cables with green tags attached, which indicates 800 megahertz, and the ones below have got cables with red tags, which indicates 1800 megahertz. Now these modules, I think, are Huawei, maybe Nokia, and we can see that two feeders comes out of every module. So that's slightly different to the RBS6102 examples that we've seen so far in this video. So now that we've seen inside the cabinets and cabins of the operators, I think it's time to just have a little look inside some of the monopoles themselves. Now obviously the monopoles are designed to hide the antennas and equipment to reduce visual obstruction. However, they do of course contain very much the same equipment as you'd see on a normal mast. So at the bottom of some monopoles there are, are an array of combiners to combine say low frequency, say 100 and 900 megahertz are very common and we can see this at the bottom of this Hutchinson Streetworks pole there are the, the Catherine diplexers for combining 800 and 900 megahertz. Now at the top of these monopoles like I said it's basically just a shroud around a series of antennas so inside the big Jupiter monopoles, there tends to be triple band panels, as we can see here, triple band cathrion panels. But once again, due to the size of the shroud, they can fit actually a whole array of different things inside them. The Alifab's shrouded streetworks poles also have fairly typical panels in them. And again, this varies depending on which specific streetworks model it is, but the smaller lollipop style ones have single band panels in them. And we can see just an example inside one here with Catherine single band panels complete with masted amplifiers. Thanks for watching this video about the inside of mast. It has been a quite requested video and I've quite enjoyed actually making it. So um, I hope to see you on the next video.